Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this session, which is Digital Hospital Experience. Uh, this session is in combination with Schneider Electric, Fortwire, and Microsoft. My name is Chris Roberts. I am the Global Solution Architect and Solution Director for our healthcare segment. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have joining us today, uh, Verika Lefty from Fortwire. Hi, Chris. Um, happy, we're happy to be here today. Um, my name is Eureka. I'm a healthcare solution specialist here at Thoughtwire. Um, I'm really involved in um, strategic partnership building and, you know, maintaining the relationship we have with our partners and building new ones, as well as really supporting the um, healthcare suite of applications that Thoughtwire has to offer. Um, a little bit about, about my background. Um, I am a registered nurse and I've practiced uh, frontline um, in pediatric critical care. Um, as well as I completed a, my master's of e-health and you know I'm, I'm, my experience in at the front line uh, has really driven me to, to be in a place where we can um, optimize workflow to deliver the best uh, patient care and really allow clinicians to practice at the top of their license so I'm hoping that um, this will give us an opportunity to walk through potential ways that we can we can facilitate that. Fantastic. Well, we're really pleased you're, you're with us today. And I think as an agenda, what we will do is we'll go through an overview uh, of what we mean by digital, and then we'll jump into more of a demonstration, a demonstration of the clinical pathway and how technology really interacts through that pathway. We look at the data that we gather and how we can derive insights from that data. And then towards the end, we'll, we'll have a 15-minute panel discussion uh, with Microsoft, Fortwire, and Schneider. Um, so let's jump straight into it. When we think of healthcare, we really need to consider the trends which are really happening in the market. Uh, and when we think of those trends in the market, we're really looking at a population which is growing globally. It's, it's aging glo globally. You know, and this is putting a huge stress on all health systems. And the NHS is no exception of that. But when we start to see this increase in terms of age, there's a bigger demand on inpatient and acuity, but also healthcare that needs to be delivered in the community and in the home. We also know that there's a shortage of healthcare workers and why digitization is so, so key for healthcare industries. But we know that with the NHS, uh, NHS Digital released some numbers to say that the shortage of registered nurses has increased by 13% from last year. So we know that an increase in terms of people who need help, a shortage of workers, really need to think of how digital technology can really help. Another area which we see in healthcare is because we're moving across the digital is that we see a lot more um, cyber attacks on the healthcare industry particularly during COVID, where we saw an increase on that, a system, an industry that was really stressed and, and vulnerable. Um, it was a target for cyber cyber attacks. We saw this in, in Ireland with their uh, health service, uh, which was almost shut down. And we've seen a number of attacks in the, in the US market as well. We also know that when we think of healthcare and we're thinking of healthcare of the future, uh, we really need to think about sustainability. The National Health Service has implemented or has put in place quite ambitious um, you know, carbon targets. Uh, and this is really where we see this globally, where we need to really think of a health system and how we contribute to population health. And finally, you know, healthcare is really about the patient. And as we move towards more patient-centered care, it's really about how do we deliver care in the community to the patient that's really convenient to them. And that's about improving quality and safety of care, but it's also about thinking of well-being and really delivering care so that we can drive better population health. And when we look at the market and we really think of what that future is going to look like, we really see what we call an all digital, all electric world. This is where we really see digitization and electrification are going to be two enablers that are critical to the success of healthcare of the future. This is going to help healthcare facilities to adapt to challenges, and it's really going to help them build healthcare infrastructures that are really going to stand the test of time. So digitization and electrification are very key enablers in terms of how we think about healthcare of the future. And when we think of healthcare of the future, that vision that we really see is around data-driven decisions. It's about proactive, actionable insights that are not only gonna improve the patient care and outcomes, but it's gonna help in terms of how we deliver operational efficiency in our organization. But once we start to think about data, we need to protect that data, whether it's patient and staff privacy or whether it's to do with business continuity. So data-driven, but doing it in a secure way. It's about building healthcare facilities for purpose, thinking about how that infrastructure is really going to impact and improve patient and staff safety. It's going to increase or improve clinical outcomes. And it's really going to be a facility that is really got a good reputation for delivering high quality care. But as we build for purpose, we also need to think about functionality and how that functionality can change over time. And this is where we need to think about flexible infrastructures because we need to adapt to patient needs, changing patient needs, changing populations, and also 
um, the involvement of technology. We also need to be climate conscious. And this is really where we need to take on board sustainability. How do we make sure that we build healthcare systems that are sustainable, that are going to help reduce our global carbon footprint, but also going to help in terms of how we drive down costs in an organization into a health system. And it's about being climate resilient as well. We need that infrastructure to be able to adapt and recover from climate related shocks. We need to reduce the amount of disruption that we have and increase continuity of care. And the pandemic has been a good example of that in terms of how our infrastructures needed to be flexible and adaptable to the changing needs uh, um, of the patient acuity. And when we think modern operations and we think of digital health and we think of this vision about being data driven, it's about transparency. It's about transparency of data, not just across your facility, but it's across your whole health ecosystem, your continuity of care. So how do we make sure that we don't have disconnected facilities and disconnected systems that are gonna impact both efficiency in terms of how we deliver health, but also efficiency in terms of how we manage and operate healthcare facilities. It's also gonna impact patient care. The less data that we have in transparency, it could have an impact on how we deliver patient care. And this is where digital can really help in terms of the transformation of a health system, because we can start to now connect that integrated care network. We could think about how we connect these facilities, facility systems, and also medical systems, so that we can now start to capture and properly store data coming from sensors, coming from systems, coming from people so that we can start to use that information so that we can use it in real time to take actions for patients and staff. Once we have all of this data and we're using it for real time actions, this is where we start to get what we call meaningful use and meaningful insights out of that data. And this is really where digital transformation starts to really impact patient outcomes and how we deliver health in society. And what do we mean when we talk about digital? Digital is not just about applying technology. What we're really looking at is how we can apply technology to practices so that we can really deliver better outcomes. And this could be outcomes in you know, the acute inpatient environment. It could be outcomes in the home environment. What we're really trying to drive is by getting that connectivity and transparency so that we can think about how we improve or enhance patient care, how we can improve operational efficiencies, how we can improve safety management and how we can really think about sustainable solutions. So when we think about digital, it's about connecting so that we can deliver better outcomes. And when we think about how we achieve that, there are different frameworks that we can think around digital and digital maturity curves. But one of the ones which we've, we've looked at is kind of taking the example from what we see in the clinical environment, where we have the infrastructure and maturity models, or we have the electronic health record adoption stages, and looking at those different stages for how we can adopt and work our way up to what we call meaningful use. So it starts by your infrastructure systems. It's about making sure that you have a digital ready building infrastructure. So going away from having proprietary siloed systems and making sure that all your systems are digital ready. Digital ready on your electrical, your HVAC, your security systems, so that they can, they're can they enabled to share data. Once we have that digitized infrastructure, it's about taking that data from these systems and devices and then really moving into what we call a digitized facility operations. And this is where we can take that data so that we can use analytics, so that we can drive business improvements around maintenance efficiency, but it's also about helping us change into more of an insight facility management program, moving away from reactive and more into a condition and reliability based approach. And finally, once we start to get all that infrastructure really connected and interoperable, it's then about connecting the operational systems with the IT and the clinical system, so that we can think about how we optimize processes, how we move over to mobile-based applications that are really gonna enhance the interaction between the clinical and facility systems. And this is what we mean by meaningful use, because this is where we can now start to get into what we call real-time health systems, which is really about outcome-based workflows and self-optimizing infrastructures. And this is the value of where we get data and integration across your infrastructure. And technology is available for us to be able to do that. You know, digital technologies allow us to be able to connect more systems, allow us to run more analytics against that data so that we can get real-time insights. So the opportunity is there for us today, as long as we think about how we want to apply that technology. And when we think about applying that technology, we really want to think about the mission of that health system. How do we enable healthcare of the future by using an IoT platform approach? A platform approach that's really focused on patient centricity where we want to be able to design a building to be responsive to the people and patients, that's safer, healthier, more comfortable environment, 
It's about thinking about hyper efficiency and thinking about that digital platform that's seamlessly going to control end to end so that we can help around better decision making for people's needs, space resources, asset efficiency and energy costs. It's also about making sure that we're resilient and that we can quickly recover and bounce back from any incident. This is about remote operations, power reliability. It's about making sure that we safeguard against cybersecurity and that we build infrastructures that are flexible and adaptable. And we need to make sure that we protect the critical infrastructure and we protect the assets of a healthcare facility. And lastly, it's about sustainability. So thinking about the healthcare facility and how we can equip it with flexible energy assets and be able to use various electrical sources. So this is maximizing renewables and the impact that we have on society. It's about active and positive energy management. It's about making sure that we think about sustainability when we're designing and when we're doing retrofits in an organization. And this is really how we can think about healthcare of the future. But the future starts now. You know, hospitals are where life's everyday and extraordinary moments take place. And the technology has been implemented in different ways of, of fashions. And it's about how we can work with an end user to understand how technology can really improve their business outcomes. So what we're now going to do is we're going to move over to a demo. Verika is going to walk us through that day in the life and how the technology interacts during that process. Chris, thank you for such a, a wonderful presentation and really highlighting uh, the key trends that are currently happening in, in the healthcare world there. I think the best way to showcase what we really mean by smart and digitally driven and connected healthcare facility is to illustrate a day in the life. And in this, in this example, we have nurse Melissa and a few workflows associated with managing and coordinating care for her patients. What you see here illustrated on the screen are four clinical users that play a critical role in any healthcare facility operations. So we have a primary nurse, we have a charge nurse here, Ben, uh, our porter, Chris, as well as our clerk, uh, Cynthia. So the notification manager allows users to dynamically coordinate uh, patient care in real time directly from their mobile devices. As soon as Melissa um, comes onto her shift at 7 a.m. in the morning, she logs in with her credentials. Her assignment is right away displayed on the screen. So this information is pulled from the integration with the centralized assignment tool. In this case, it's Cloudwire's centralized assignment tool, but can be any uh, centralized assignment system that already exists in a facility as Cloudwire is, is vendor agnostic and can be interoperable with um, already a solution that exists in the hospital. So Melissa will only have to sign in once um, and on the other systems should be able to access it with uh, no additional need to, to authenticate. Um, what she sees here on the screen is the patient assignment, any team assignments. So in this situation, she's not assigned to any other teams, um, as well as a few event subscriptions that um, it would be nice for Melissa to be aware of, but she might not necessarily engage or be an active participant in them. Now, Melissa has been communicated in a handover as soon as she came on that uh, patient Irene Cole here one of her many patients uh, out of six today here on the respirology unit, that um, she's a new admission and will be coming up from the ER department shortly. Chris, and I just want to bring it back to you here that um, through the integration with the admission and discharge system, as well as the electronic medical record, the building management system, how is a patient's room identified, located, and really optimized for their admission? Yeah, I think this is really interesting and shows, shows the value of, of why we want to have that data integrated because we're looking at assigning a patient into a room uh, and typically the, that room will just control normal. And what we can see here is that the room is actually empty. And when we know that the room is empty, the patient might have been discharged earlier in the day and we can go into what we call energy setback modes. But as soon as we see that admission system that's coming from the health system, we're going to get relevant information to tell us um, to turn that system on. In this case, we move into an occupied state to make sure we have the right lighting levels, make sure that we're controlling temperature correctly. We might open the blinds depending on the time of day to give it that welcome environment. But what we're also pulling through is we can see down at the bottom there, we have what we call patient context. And this is now where we're pulling in information to do with patient falls risk or to do with infection precautions for that patient because we know that the built environment might contribute or have an impact on both of these uh, parameters. We think of, of COVID, uh, where we all rush to kind of negative pressure rooms. If we think of flexible and adaptable healthcare infrastructures in the future, if we know a patient's going into a room who is an infection precaution, can we now start to adjust some of the HVAC parameters? 
can we start to move that into a negative room? And we can see here that we now have this room in a negative pressure relationship. And this is where we monitor, make sure the doors are closed, make sure that that pressure is maintained so that we're safeguarding the clinical uh, practitioners who might get um, interact with that patient. So that's just about taking context from the patient and applying it to how we control and operate a patient room in a patient environment. The other thing that we have in here is, is really about making sure that we can connect the patient to their infrastructure and to the environment inside of that patient room. It's all about comfort and kind of relieving that stress levels when they're in there, you know, alleviating some of the, the hot and cold calls that we get in facility departments. But we allow them to be able to connect through their mobile device or through an infotainment system. The ability now to control the lights inside of that room, to be able to adjust the temperature, set points, uh, and even to open and close the blinds from, from their bed. So it's all about giving them full flexibility and control in the environment. But what we do here is because we know the context of that patient, if this patient decided to, to close the blinds and turn the lights off in the room, what we actually do with that system is we know there are falls risk. So because we know that context comes from the medical record system, we can actually start to now look at how we've maybe put on up lighting in the area. And you can see the small up light um, to the right of the infotainment screen, that yellow box, which is really saying, okay, because there are falls of risk, let's make sure we put in some precautions in case they do get up in the middle of the night. So this is all about just taking that context of the patient, whether it's infection, whether it's a fall risk, and then changing some of the parameters of how we control the built space. Chris, um, that's fantastic. I think really giving the patient more control of their environment and really health is, is what we're moving forward towards. And it's, this can have a huge positive impact on patient satisfaction. So if we, um, if we go back here to our nurse, Melissa, she is conducting a set of vitals and an initial assessment um, that was directly inputted at the patient's bedside uh, upon admission. So she can input that through her, the mobile application. She goes ahead and opens the UI board for displays a bird's eye view of all the patients in the respirology unit that she's working. This gives Melissa an opportunity to have a quick overview of any pending items or other healthcare related indicators such as uh, falls risk, any pending labs, infection precaution. So here we see that um, patient Irene has those indicators listed for her profile in, in the cortex. And as um, Melissa takes a look at the, um, at the whiteboard, she receives a nurse call alarm from, from patient Irene. So if we go at the mobile notification, she has an alert here and we can see that uh, the patient in bed two uh, has, has initiated a nurse call event. Melissa responds to the nurse call and Irene requests um, assistance with using the washroom. So as, as Melissa makes her way there, now Chris, as she's doing that, let's see what happens to the patient's room environment after the call has been initiated. Yeah, so this, this is really where we can take alerts, whether it's coming from the nurse call system or it may be information coming from the intelligent bed to do with movement or pressure monitoring. But once we know that that patient might be moving or they've called the nurse, the nurse hasn't responded after a a certain period of time, we can then look at how we can again safeguard that patient by turning on the lights in the environment. If we know that they want to go um, to the washroom, you know, can we allow the, the, the nursing staff to actually turn on their lights? So this is all about making sure that we just give that controllability, whether it's an automated sequence, or whether we put the control into the hands of the caregiver, just so that we can reduce some of the kind of hospital incidences that could happen inside of a patient room. It may be also that we have a code blue event in that room. You know, we want to make sure we have the right task lighting. Uh, but one of the interesting things we, we talked about uh, Veronica, was sometimes we want to close the blinds inside of an area because people outside might not want to see in if it's a close up to over windows. So that flexibility is, is all available now because we're actually sharing that data. And then we can set those sequences based on how the health system wants to operate and how they want to put in that sequence of events. Exactly, Chris. I know we had that discussion about, you know, the level of privacy um, that exists in a hospital and how we really want to maintain that. And really, we have here an opportunity to both automate and give the, the, the patient control, uh, both, both to the patient, the clinician, as well as automatically integrated in, with the building management system so we can optimize the patient's environment and mitigate the risk of falls. So I just want to quickly um, illustrate here how Melissa, for example, if it's not automatically integrated through the building management system, how she can control from her mobile device um, the patient's environment. So we see here the patient's room environment and how she can control the temperature and light levels directly from her mobile device. 
and I think that's a fantastic, um, fantastic opportunity. And knowing my practice at the bedside, I, I didn't have such luxury. So um, I think that's really amazing. So if, if we think back uh, to the to the flow and Melissa's work day, after the nurse call event, um, she received admission orders that have been inputted into the EMR or EHR system. And an order has been placed for a diagnostic imaging test. Luckily again, Melissa can request a transport uh, directly from her mobile device. So she opens the patient's cardex again, and she could go ahead and request a transport request right away. And as we can see here, we have a little bit of demographic information that Melissa can verify. And we also see that from information has already been pre-populated with the integration with the ABT system, which saves a few extra clicks in the process and speeds up the workflow. And a few extra clicks here, a few extra clicks there, and limiting the number of sign-ons and so on can really have a huge time-saving impact for the clinician. So Melissa will go ahead and fill out the two, uh, so the destination, and we know that Irene has been uh, scheduled a diagnostic imaging test. So she will be needing to go to the imaging check-in. Another important component here that um, Melissa can communicate to those other stakeholders involved in this workflow is the type of equipment that will be accompanied to, by the patient and if there are any additional precautions. So in this situation, um, Irene has an IV pole as well as she is in droplet contact precautions. So this will really allow the porter to know what exact equipment he needs to bring in um, in order to avoid, you know, searching for equipment on the floor or even throughout the hospital, as well as for the clerk to prepare effectively for any additional infection precautions uh, that are required. So Melissa will go ahead and submit this request. And as you note here, uh, since Melissa is, was initiating this transport request, she has a notification as well. But now Chris, our porter here, has a transport alert and alarm notified on his phone, as well as Cynthia, the clerk. So if we think about why was Chris selected as the porter to route this alert to, right? A lot of the times, transporting the patient involves many stakeholders. It can be a transport, a portering uh, team, or it can be many volunteers, healthcare providers, nurses, really a lot of people that could involve could be involved in, in the transport of a patient. But in this situation, the Thoughtwire digital platform really connects to a multitude of systems and data points and is able to understand the context around this transport request. So Chris was selected because likely he is the closest available order and location. So proximity to the patient is uh, much um, closer. That way they can get to the unit or department faster to be able to facilitate this transport request, as well as Chris is not currently on break. Therefore, his availability status is free, as well as it's considering any cues that already exist. So if a porter had a long types of tasks or a long list of cues, it, the, this new alert will not be routed to them. It will be routed to the most appropriate porter. So now that Chris is available, he'll go ahead and accept this transport request. And as you, as you see here on Melissa's phone, we see a notification that porter has accepted the request. Now, since Melissa is well aware that uh, you know Chris is going to be coming in and taking the, the patient. She's preparing um, Irene with, um, with any necessary equipment or um, the, the process involved in, in bringing down a patient to the diagnostic imaging. So as patient is ready, she's also notifying um, Chris that now the patient is ready for pickup. So this really, as we progress through the patient transport journey, we can see that there's increased visibility and collaboration and really control of the patient's journey. Everyone is aware at what point in the journey the patient is. So now that the Chris has arrived, he can notify that the patient uh, um, porter has arrived and can pick up successfully the patient. And I know from experience from, from bedside that a lot of the times I had to pick up the phone uh, call dispatching for them to identify a porter for me. Um, I wouldn't have an, a, a time when they're coming. I have to attend to my other patient's needs. I'm likely, you know, in another room providing care to another patient. Now the porter is waiting for me. I have to prep the patient and hand over. So it, it really allows us to, to optimize how, it, how we, we facilitate this workflow and also it facilitated more efficiently. So now that the patient has picked up, has been picked up, 
uh, Cynthia here is also aware that the patient is, is, is on their way. So every time the user clicks and takes an action, it is recorded and timestamped to optimize visibility and ensure that closed loop communication um, and collaboration is happening. So Chris, once the patient leaves their room, can you let us know how this change has been reflected in the patient's room environment, if, if any? This is again just by connecting the OT and the IT world. We know that that patient has been picked up. We know that they've been taken out for procedure. So we can put that room into what we call unoccupied status. We want to keep it in a negative pressure because we know that patient's coming back and an infection precaution patient has been in there. But this now enables us to again, you know, turn off lighting. We might also want to notify facility teams or housekeeping to tell them that there's an available window for a time period for how long they'll be out where this room is now unoccupied. So just having those triggers in place by knowing where a patient is in their journey allows us to be able to plan and look at how we can do activities in the room where we might not have been able to. And a lot of data shows us that even though a hospital might be you know, fully utilized with its beds, you know, those patient rooms might be empty for a lot of the time. Um, and this is an opportunity, not only for around energy savings, but around some of the operation efficiencies that we might want to apply into that patient room. So it's just about connecting it, understanding the pathway, understanding where that patient is inside of the organization and making sure that your infrastructure systems are adapting and are changing based on what's happening with the patient context. That's great, Chris. And I think through this workflow, we really see how important the patient's environment is in being aware of the clinical components as well to be able to have a comprehensive overview and understanding of of what impacts patient care and how we can optimize existing resources and efficiently use them. So now that um, Irene is finally at the destination, Cynthia is just confirming that patient has arrived and this transport request has officially been completed. So we can go ahead and clear all the notifications here. And um, now Irene will effectively be um, undergoing her diagnostic imaging. So really, um, this would be an opportunity for environmental staff to either clean the room to, to really prep it for an optimal environment on patient's return. So we can see how effective clinical and building integration can facilitate um, an optimal workflow and really better orchestration of resources. I just want to take this opportunity to recap what we've had a chance to walk through right now, really by showing a visual of the Cloudfire digital twin and healthcare offering with the integration with, with the building side. So we see here a healthcare organization full of connected or connectable things that can be uni unified to drive new use cases and provide a better experience for patients and care providers. So we see a collection of devices, applications, equipment, appliance, and, and buildings that possess the intelligence and technology to connect, communicate, and be interoperable uh, with each other to improve operational efficiency and gain access to really previously siloed information by improving patient outcomes and also reducing clinical burnout. So I think this is, a, is really a great overview um, to, to really transition that now we've seen a clinical workflow with an integration with a building system. We've seen all these data sources that we've illustrated. So now where, where does all this data get collected to and, and what do we, do we do with it? So I think it's a great transition now to uh, illustrate the, anal the ThoughtWire's analytical dashboard, or we also call it the nerve center. So Chris, I will just hand it over to you um, to really, since we've identified a correlation there between the falls incidents and light levels, walk us through a little bit uh, what this analytical dashboard really communicates to us. Yeah, I mean, with, with this type of dashboard, what we're really looking at is, is how we can understand the built environment's impact on something such as you know, falls incidences by ward. So traditionally, that might have been something from a facility department where you're looking at lighting you know, based on energy, energy reduction, energy savings. But if you now start to have a look at the impact it actually has on falls risk, what are some of the mitigation or preventative strategies that you can do to kind of improve or reduce the amount of falls you might have in your health system? So looking at falls incidences by property, you know, we can see here clearly that you know, the amount of um, incidences typically happen when fixtures are off or we're in an economy mode. So by understanding that data, what is our economy mode and our, can we make alterations or modifications to that so that we can help improve and reduce some of those falls risks. Looking at it by department, you know, this helps us really 
marry up that information so that we can start to then say, well, if we start to improve your know, minimum lighting levels by 10% um, over a period, um, you know, what is the impact that we will have actually have on falls? And not just around light levels, but also anything in that built space. If you're now thinking of your know, indoor air quality, whether it's temperature, humidity, um, airflow in an area, how does that actually contribute to things like um, your know, comfort scores? Uh, what does it do to average length of stay, hospital readmissions? It's now the ability to start merging that data so that you can get that informatic analysis from it so that you can understand if the built environment actually is having an impact on something to do with falls risk or hospital readmissions. And this is really the value of where you take that data from the, the built, built systems for ecostructure, you combine it with the Fortwire platform, and that's when we start to get into that kind of real-time health system where data is really giving us valuable information for how the built space is impacting patient outcomes. Yeah, I, uh, Chris, I 100% agree. I think it's an important correlation and there's so many insights that we can gather from all the data, all the rich, big data that's coming in um, and we're normalizing it and we're adding meaning and context to it to really be able to connect siloed information and optimize how and, and how efficiently we deliver care. And I think uh, another important point here that I want to highlight is especially that the healthcare sector has been disproportionately impacted by the global pandemic with all the staff shortages, burnt out staff, many really leaving the medical profession completely. And, and it's, it's really sad and um, devastating for us. Um, so especially at this point really hits home for me because I know firsthand the impact of a short staffed unit um, on staff morale as well as patient care. And I think here we have a fantastic opportunity to leverage all the data collecting through the digital twin, normalize it, add context to it, and really derive meaningful opportunities for change and actionable outcomes. So uh, we've, we've followed Melissa through her journey and uh, she currently works on the respiro respirology unit. And it, it, the, our dashboard shows that the average um, staff capacity should be about you know, four to five patients. In other words, you know, about five patients per nurse. When we look at the current capacity here on the respirology unit, it really shows, and as Melissa's um, staffing and, and, and assignment showed, she had um, six patients and sometimes you have to cover for um, your partner. So it, it's really taking a big strain on the healthcare provider. One additional patient can really become a critical factor in determining the quality and safety of care, patient outcome, and really have a huge impact on the amount of overtime, uh, nursing burnt out, and burnout, and staff retention rates. So eventually, needing to train new nurses, which can cause additional additional spendings and really already strained staff. So as a unit manager, if we switch a little bit gears, as a unit manager or an operations manager, I can dynamically utilize the command center that pulls in centralized assignment information to highlight that we currently have four unassigned nurses that can be effectively engaged to alleviate the respirology department. So this data-driven coordination really allows us to optimize staffing, to reduce workload on, on all the respirology nurses that already are so strained and really have superior capacity management. So again, we have a centralized, we have centralized the data, we've analyzed it, and we really utilize um, both historical as well as real-time data coupled with predictive analytics and advanced insights to improve workflow and really enhance how we deliver care. And Chris, we've seen the patient transport and logistics workflow, and we've seen the journey of a patient and the process around it. Can you provide some more context on how we can utilize the insights from the analytical dashboard to streamline workflow, transport activities, and, and better orchestrate the resources uh, that we have? Yeah, I mean, this dashboard is, is really interesting because it takes both historical and, and future kind of predictions around that data. And that's really the value of having this information all consolidated together. So we can see here that you know, we're looking at average transport times, which you know, has a huge impact on patient experience and patient flow. Um, but really, you know, how are we doing in terms of the duration versus the prediction? And the prediction is really important because the prediction is going to take in, into consideration things to do with maintenance activities. So we can see down at the bottom here, you know, how many unavailable stretches do we have um, in terms of kind of asset equipment, but also what's happening with the lifts or the elevators inside of that facility? And what is the impact of a maintenance activity going to have on the clinical pathway? 
And this is where we start to see, you know, maintenance impacting some of the transport times, but not only, not does it just impact it, but we can plan for it. If we can be predictive about these activities that's going to take place, it's really where we can then start to plan around those influences. And that's really the value of the data. It's not just about taking that data and, and taking historical understanding of it, but it's about having historical understanding that we can predict what's going to happen in the future and how we can plan around events such as maintenance activities so that we're not impacting any of the clinical pathways or we're increasing continuity of care. And I think that's a really good segue for us to move into the panel discussion. Now we would like to jump into the panel discussion. So joining Barika and myself on the panel, uh, we have Matt Fox uh, from Microsoft, uh, who is the account CTO for the Department in Health and Social Care. So Matt, thanks for joining us. And we also have Dale Hall, uh, who is the co-founder and executive vice president at ThoughtWire. Dale, thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, excellent. So let's just jump into some first questions. So Matt, um, if we can start with you, please. So Matt, you know, as we've seen through the demonstration, the ability to collect data is only increasing uh, in facilities. Can you tell us a little bit about Microsoft's strategy around data utilization and optimization with the NHS? Yeah, sure. So um, I think data has always been the golden thread to NHS improvement and a better patient experience. I think the last 18 months has shown us just how incredibly impactful data can be. When it's collated and used in the right way, you only have to look at the COVID data dashboards as an example of this. And when you think that that website is the most visited since .gov.uk was launched in 2012, you can then start to see how important data is, not just for the NHS as an organisation, but also for the patient and the citizen. And of course, then we're also seeing cloud support faster ingestion, uh, processing and manipulation of data in a way that we've never possibly seen previously. So, for example, in the area of optimization at the Business Services Authority, once prescription data has been ingested, we use cognitive services to read both typed and handwritten scribes so that pharmacies can receive accurate payments. Now, typically, the BSA scans about 6 million paper prescriptions per month. And in addition, they have 200 or more people doing data entry due to optical character recognition failures when those prescriptions are scanned. So that's 1.8 million forms per month that require human intervention. And when we build the service with them, we reimagined that ratio and now 90% of those previously unreadable forms can be interpreted by Azure with a very high degree of accuracy, which is obviously very important when we come back to those pharmacies who need accurate payments. As a business, our strategy will be to continue to provide scalable open data services built on trust and security so that our customers can be sure that their data remains their data. I mean, that's, that's a great example of where you know, technology is helping around some inefficiencies that we might have had with, with handwritten notes. So it's a great example. And, and do Microsoft have any key initiatives underway with the National Health Service at the moment? Um, I, I, we're, we're doing a lot of work with the, with the NHS, clearly. I'm not sure I would highlight any specific initiatives as such, but with the incoming integrated care system model, we are clearly seeing a need to have a scalable, secure data architecture in place that provides our customers with the ability to not just share data, but also to collaborate on that data, which supports then the broader health and social care agenda. I think at the end of the day, we are very industry focused. We will align to the Data Saves Lives government strategy, which was recently published. And there's sort of seven pillars to that strategy. But if I distill them down into the three core areas that we would focus on, they would be around number one, building the right foundations from a technical, regulatory and legal perspective. Secondly, making data sharing the norm. So use existing data sets, hold them once, process it many times and enable continuous research on those data sets. And then thirdly, to drive clinical and operational improvements. So things like population health management, capacity planning, precision medicine. Um, ultimately, we want the NHS to realise value from their data assets. And we're quite deliberate about how we want to help them do that. That's great. I love that term, collaborating around the data sets. I think that's, that's, that's really key to what we've really uh, been thinking and what we showed in the demo. 
and, and Dale, you know, from the demo, you know, it really shows the power of Fortwire's platform and the ability to ingest and kind of contextualize data from a wide variety of sources. But what have been some of the main obstacles that you have seen health systems face when they've tried to achieve this level of digitization? Yeah, I think I can break it down into three key areas. Um, obviously, one of the initial problems healthcare organizations face in their move towards digitization is first gaining access to the real-time data needed to uncover insights into clinical and building operations. Connectors or interfaces to all different classes of data sources, be it clinical, OT, IT, or IoT, are very important to harness the organization's data and support a greater visibility, uh, but also real-time workflow and operational efficiency outcomes. The second obstacle is making use of the data from those various data sources and numerous vendors to support that real-time decision-making, which provides the greatest impact to patients, clinical staff, and the organization as a whole. So that we feel like the best way to make that data actionable is to normalize it into standard ontologies for clinical and operational purposes. This technique also provides the ability to use this data for rich analytical uses, as well as for continued process improvement. The next major obstacle is finding a way to leverage all that data and all the real-time insights it can drive by providing it to frontline and operational staff to support patient care. This means providing the right user-focused applications to make use of that information to support healthcare workflow. That's great. And maybe this is a good point to put, pull you in, Barika. So we talk about you know, getting digital and digital technologies in the hands of clinicians to improve workflows. But you know, from, from your past experience at working at the bedside, you know, what are some of the change management processes that we, we should be thinking about to help with the adoption of technology? Yeah, <clears throat> Chris, I think this is a great point and, and really important to consider when we think about introducing a new technology into, into healthcare. Um, it, it is natural as humans that we tend to resist change and, and clinical, clinical people are, are no different. And I think uh, determining inter, uh, implementation readiness, I think, is key if we want a successful, um, a successful implementation and adoption. And as I'm reflecting, I guess, on this, on this question, I think a few thing, themes really uh, stand out to me. I think one is end user engagement. Um, and doubtfully, uh, this is one of the most important uh, points because uh, clinicians, healthcare providers, they know their best, their current state, and they know what they need, what is working for them, and what is not working for them. So. Uh, when they're fully involved and um, really uh, determine what, what is the process going forward and what uh, is required, I think that a change becomes easier to manage. I think that solution designing is, um, is smoother and I think product acceptance and adoption is, um, is, is faster. And I think also um, I said that there are, are a lot of users and an important here is to understand that there's different type of users. So we have frontline workers. There's a wide variety of, of different roles there. We have management, we have board of directors, we have government bodies. They all have slightly different interests and goals when it comes to a digital health solution. And I think really understanding and having a team that is interdisciplinary as well as understands that there's a multi-layered approach to change. I think that's huge when it comes to really have, having a successful implementation. And of course, having a well-established and, and clear goal where we want to get with that digital implementation. And I think that those are, those are key factors to be able to communicate this message to the clinical provider. That's great. And I, I mean, some people look at health care and say they've maybe been a little bit slow in terms of adoption of technology. But Matt, Matt going back to, to yourself, have you seen an acceleration in that due to due to COVID with the likes of telehealth and uh, not being able to physically go to a hospital? I, I think that you know COVID has driven a different pace of change. Um, to offer an example, NHS Digital here in England enabled the Microsoft Teams service to 1.4 million users in April May time last year. So as an industry, we have collectively proven that agility and scale is totally achievable where 
Previously, I think there's been a sentiment, as you allude to, Chris, that the public sector can be a bit slow to act. And, and I think, you know, Vera can make some great points because it's easy to talk about the technology. What is often missed is the digital skills are needed to embed and really get value from those sorts of investments. And so adoption and change management programs are, of course, a massive part of that. And across the NHS, we've seen a skyrocketing use of services like Teams for many different use cases. And again, that's predominantly because we've partnered to quite deliberately focus on some key areas like remote consultation, how you run multidisciplinary team meetings, for example, standards like HL7 and the fast healthcare interoperability resource, FIRE, are enabling greater integration to electronic patient records. Um, and of course, when you're able to ingest lots of different data types to be surfaced in teams, you can then collaborate in the context of the work that you're looking to do. And, and I think that across and outside of the NHS, there's a, there's a recognition that the world of work is just changing very, very rapidly. And that, you know, across the globe, you know, we also need to be very respectful of workforce resilience and people's ability to, to manage their work and home lives. And analytics and data and insights have a significant part to play in that area as well. Fantastic. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of what we've talked about and touched on here is, is, is around kind of the clinical side, side of healthcare. But as we saw from the demo, kind of the facilities and the buildings themselves are, are really key as well to how we deliver healthcare. So, so Dale, coming back to yourself, when we think of clinical and built spaces, can you provide some insights into, you know, why we might face barriers in terms of integrating across these two systems and, and what outcomes should health systems really be thinking, thinking about when they're, they talk about you know facility and clinical integration. Yeah, I, I mentioned previously, excuse me, the challenge around gaining access to the data because of all the various systems that exist in a, in a hospital or in any healthcare organization and all the protocols necessary to integrate and access the data. So that's you know that's that challenge is well understood. But I think that advanced technology like digital twins can support modeling the hospital as a building, as its components, but not just that. I think that you know, digital twins really need to also model the patients, the staff, the operational processes, the clinical uh, processes which are in flight. And, and that all encompassing view is what is required to really drive workflow. The other key element I think to overcoming barriers is, is making sure that you know, when you're choosing vendors, the vendor expertise is, includes clinical-based expertise as well as expert, expertise in the built space domains. So that's key and, and necessary. And I think this, that combined expertise allows for alignment of real-time and historical data uh, in such a way that it supports patient care effectively. So I'll give a couple of examples. Understanding how air quality or humidity levels in, in a general medicine ward, uh, as an example, maybe how it may be affecting outbreaks. I mean, you know, understanding the impact of the build space to patient care is key. Another example is, is clinical staffing levels and how that um, relates to you know, nurse call uh, response times. And I think even if we look at uh, you know, the patient or sort of the staffing levels, uh, to patients who may be experiencing a uh, rat falls risk and how we're actually addressing those needs to reduce those potential uh, incidents. Uh, that expertise from vendors who can uh, supply both that clinical view as well as that build space view uh, is really what is gonna drive, I think, better outcomes from enabling this technology in smart hospitals and obviously other health facilities as well. Okay, fantastic, Dale. And then, and then I guess to kind of close, close on this, so if, if we're speaking to a healthcare system, you know, how, how do they get started on their digital journey? So an, an open question to the group, what, what do we think the, the kind of key things are uh, for a customer to really think about who's going on that new journey? Quite simply, you know, I, I would be recommending that, you know, there absolutely needs to be some executive sponsorship around the change that you're trying to affect. You need some clear objectives some goals and you absolutely need to build into whatever you're going to do that adoption and change management piece as part of the process the softer side of things for me would be you know what's the vision and I, I've always quite liked this phrase what would need to be true if 
And if you look at, you know, the Care Quality Commission here in England, who are reimagining their entire inspector of process end to end, they might start out their journey by saying, what would need to be true if we were to create a world-class inspectorate informed, empowered by data, and in the process help citizens to choose the right experiences for them? So having that vision really clearly set out from the start, you know, what's the end that you've got in mind, I think is, is really important so that people kind of head in that similar direction from the outset. I say that, you know, unless you're in a greenfield scenario, you need to start off someplace. And, you know, by targeting key operational challenges that you may be facing and looking how in workflow improvement can be done through the use of information at your disposal, like we've been talking about, and putting it in the hands of the right people to help coordinate it, uh, coordinate care in a more effective manner is a good starting point. Uh, from there, it's, you have the opportunity to expand and continuously improve workflow through the use of that uh, important information and putting it in the hands of people in real time. Uh, and then obviously, you know, when we're looking at the challenges that everyone is facing relative to uh, ESG goals and the, the efficiencies of our, of our facilities, you know, tying in that building oriented information in terms of how the building itself is supporting uh, care within that hospital setting is I think another key way to focus on a project and target something with real measurable outcomes uh, that can be delivered and, and get um, support internally for those types of projects. Yeah, I think I will echo exactly what we've discussed today and really what we've showcased. Um, and again, I will just emphasize how important it is to understand what the user needs uh, to be able to understand the complexity of the system, the ecosystem, all the players involved. And I think uh, really uh, the bottom line is we want excellent patient care and we want all those involved to really practice at the top of their license. So if we can facilitate that, then we can create an environment where a patient has a healing environment and the clinician has an opportunity to really provide the best care possible. I think we have a success there. That's great. So some really, really good words of wisdom there. So, so Matt, Dale, uh, Varika, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, your insights been been very valuable. Um, Thank everyone for, for listening to the session. Um, we encourage you to join us on our virtual booth. Uh, and also, if you would like to learn more, uh, to join Schneider Elect Shop for a workshop, workshop uh, on Thursday at 11 a.m., uh, where we'll be discussing creating a fully connected hospital. So thank you.